Good morning. We're so happy you could join us for this edition of Six News on the Record with Buddy Cienci. I'm ABC Six News anchor John DeLuca. I'm in for Buddy Cienci this week, who is not feeling well. So glad you could join us this morning. Our guest, the president of the Rhode Island chapter of the NAACP, Mr. Jim Vincent. Jim, good to have you with us this hey, morning. Thank you, John, for inviting me. Great to have you. Yes. Uh, this Monday, as you know, federal holiday, we celebrated Martin Luther King Jr. Day. As you look back at this point in your life, when you think of Martin Luther King Jr., you think of that holiday, what are some of the things that come into your life at this point? Well, one of the things that I think about is all the progress that has been made since his death in 1968. You know, I think he would be amazed by some of the progress. I mean, look at what's happened, let's say, in sports. You know, when he was alive, you didn't have black head coaches in the NFL or even black quarterbacks. Uh, in the private sector, you didn't have uh, CEOs of McDonald's, of Xerox, of American Express. Uh, look at in, in the political world. You know, we've had one Secretary of State, we've had two African American Attorney Generals, five U.S. Senators, two black governors, and over 40 black congressmen. Not to mention the election of an African American president twice. And also, Martin Luther King never saw the Confederate flag coming down in southern, southern sites like the South Carolina State House. So I think he'd be amazed by that. But I also think he'd be really dismayed by the police brutality that's going on from coast to coast. All the African American young men that we hear about that have been killed under the most questionable circumstances by law enforcement. The gutting of the Civil Rights Act, I mean the Voting Rights Act of 65 by the Supreme Court. He'd be really upset about that. All the restrictive voting laws that have come in since the Barack Obama was elected president. Before he was elected, there were two states that had photo ID laws. Now there's over 30 since he's been elected president. He'd be upset about that. And he'd be upset about uh, the fact that you, you have unemployment. The black unemployment rate is still double that of the white unemployment rate. 50 years later, no change. Blacks earn only 70 cents to every white dollar today. And black wealth, family wealth is only 5% of white family wealth. So he would be really disappointed in some of those things 50 years later. And that's what he would see here in America. What about so it's mixed. It is mixed and certainly a lot of work to be done. Yeah. As you mentioned, a lot of progress in yeah. a lot of different areas as well. But it's sort of become a, a day of service, if you will, a day on, as I've heard people say, mm -hmm. as opposed to a day off. What do you think about that, how it's turned into a public service day and young kids are learning about Dr. King in that way? I, I think it's great. I think, you know, any time you can have young kids doing service or anybody doing service, you know, doing something for people that are, are in need, that's a great, that's a great time. So if, if Martin Luther King's Day can organize and galvanize people to do service here in this country or in Rhode Island, that's a good thing. And I'm, I'm glad that people do use that day uh, for that. So it's not really a day off, it's a day on. It really is. And you mentioned uh, President Obama, uh, and this is a video from uh, uh, Monday, uh, mm -hmm. Governor Raimondo at the Ebenezer Baptist Church uh, honoring the works and celebrating. This is some of the day on that we talked about. Mm -hmm. Students in Fall River and other areas across this Southeastern Mass taking part in different activities that they can to. Uh, this is actually the um, <coughs> the uh, Muslim school and the Jewish community school getting together. Now that's great. Working together Think in about honoring uh, the service of Martin Luther King. Uh, you mentioned the president and uh, you were a guest from Senator Reed mm -hmm. to go to that State of the Union address, and I know you were thrilled about that opportunity. Tell me, take me through the whole thing, and, and not only from your perspective as the head of the Rhode Island chapter of the NAACP, but as an American citizen. What was that like just going through there and seeing that? Well, I mean, nothing's better than that. I mean, in terms of uh, political theater, because you have all different levels of government there. You have not just all the U.S. Senators, but you have all the congressmen. You have the whole entire Supreme Court. You have the Joint Chiefs of Staff. You have the Cabinet. You have the ambassadors, all in the same room with the president. You have, you have the first lady, the, the vice president's there, the speaker of the house sitting behind him, the vice president's wife up there sitting next to the first lady. I mean, you, know, you really can see everyone <laughs> that's there. And the place is a little bit more, it's a little smaller than I thought it was going to be. Isn't that always the way? Yeah. It, you know, people see on TV, it looks like it's so big, and you think, oh my gosh, look at this. But then when you get there, it's like, this is it, this is it. It's really small. Uh, I was in the front row gallery uh, on his left, uh, about 20 seats down from Michelle Obama, and uh, I got a chance to see, it, you know, uh, everybody. And it was just, just such a thrill because Senator Reid had one pick, and he could have picked any Rhode Islander. And to pick me, I'm very humbled by that. I'm very proud of that. And uh, certainly it's something I will never forget. So the speech itself, um, you, what did you take away from what he said? It seemed to me watching, and maybe because it was the last one as, as President Obama as the president, uh, more about what the nation is and what yeah. it's become and what it can be as yeah. opposed to 
you know, bashing or being negative. It seemed like it was trying to be an uplifting, positive thing, which a lot of people were critical of, which I was like, well, there's nothing wrong with the President of the United States saying something good about the well, American people in the, in, the, in the country. It was very positive. You know, I was amazed by all the things he has accomplished in the last seven years. I mean, think about it. Uh, seven years ago, we were hemorrhaging 800,000 jobs. Uh, we were on the brink of a recession. He's created, or the country has created, 14 million jobs in the last seven years. So that's tremendous. I mean, the auto industry's back. The airline industry is doing better than it's ever done, ever. Record-breaking profits Record-breaking right profits. Yeah. The stock market was almost double up until recently. Uh, the unemployment rate is half of what it was. I mean, when you think about some of those things, I mean, that's quite significant. And I think it's going to take a few years from now to really appreciate everything that's happened. But, but also, the Affordable Care Act. And also his work on climate change, which is important. I mean, we got a storm that's probably we're digging out from this morning. And also the Iran uh, deal in terms of uh, the nuclear weapons. So, I mean, so he's, he's been busy. You know, that's a lot, I think, in seven years by any uh, fair uh, observation. So I was taken uh, uh, to the fact that he's done quite a bit. Uh, I mean, there's still things that he needs to do, of course. I mean, nobody's done it all. But one thing I did notice that it's very partisan in that place. You know, the Democrats were carrying everything he said, and that's good, because a lot of that stuff was good. But the Republicans, some Republicans refused to chair anything. I mean, I really thought when he said, we need to find a cure for cancer, yeah. I thought they would <laughs> cheer for that. that? They, they didn't cheer for that. And then he said, America's the greatest country in the world. They didn't cheer for that. So I kind of saw how- So you noticed- I kind of saw how- Kind of hands on the hips. Yeah, I mean, if you can't cheer for cancer, uh, uh, a cure for cancer, if you can't share that America is the greatest country in the world, then I really don't see them working with him on anything. You know? Well, well there is, there are, you're right, there are some folks who just bipartisan is not in, they don't have that club in the bag. And, and maybe because it is an election year, they don't want to be seen as the guy or the woman who's clapping for something and that'll be used against them in a race or who knows how people Somebody's going to use uh, you clapping for a cure for cancer. You wouldn't think you? so, but you never know how it would be. I'm trying really? to, I'm just trying to think of things in America? as, as wow. to what it would be. That, that's interesting. Anything, Jim, that you didn't hear that you wish maybe you did hear? Yeah, maybe more about, you know, the, uh, I, I mentioned the, uh, the uh, killing of young black men across the country under the most questionable circumstances imaginable. Talking about police cases. law enforcement. Police law enforcement and, and, and how we get a better handle on that because that's a major domestic problem, uh, police brutality. I mean, the world, I mean, at the United Nations is talking about America saying, how dare they talk about human rights ab abuses when they treat their black citizens still in 2015, 2016 the way they do. And, and it's just a problem that we have to shake if we want to have that moral you know, uh, you know, that moral leadership in the, in the world in terms of talking about human rights. As you're talking about that, Jim, we're looking at footage from Ferguson, and I'm sure it'll morph into, yeah. at some point, Baltimore. Yeah. And maybe even what happened here in Rhode Island uh, with uh, young people, uh, of actually not just young people, but people of all ages getting involved with, you know, blocking 95 and, and out in front of the mall at Francis Street. Uh, people trying to make a point about what exactly you're talking about right here. Your thoughts on what happened in Baltimore over the past year and certainly in Ferguson and here in Rhode Island. Well, you know, it, it's, it's incredible that you have um, law enforcement that thinks so little of, of, of life in, in some cases. I mean, not, some. Not, some, some, not, no, 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 yeah. some. And, and, and luckily, it's, it, it, it's a minority of officers. It's not, not the majority, but there are, there are some that you know probably shouldn't be officers in the first place. They just don't have that kind of disposition to be out you know, wearing the badge and the uniform and dealing with people. Uh, because I've seen some things, I mean, uh, the, the Walter Scott getting shot eight times in the back, running away. I've seen some things I thought I would never see as an American, you know. Uh, well, Laquan McDonald in Chicago, 16 times. Being shot times. 16 times, they shot him once, and then he's down, and then they shoot him 15 times. And he's 16 years old in Chicago, and then they cover it up for over a year. I mean, th this is a major problem in America, major domestic problem in America, this police community relations thing. We gotta get it right because people are losing faith in the judiciary because the state grand jury system hasn't almost indicted anybody. So you got that problem. So it's hard to have faith in that when you see things that I see and then nobody's even being brought to justice to even go on trial. How do you so get the problem. officers out? You had mentioned as you were going through this, Jim, that you say, well, some of these folks, uh, men and women, shouldn't be yeah, law enforcement officers. Yeah. How do you get them out? Is it something that it's a better screening initially that they never become police officers yeah. or while on the job, look, you've done this, this, and this, you probably, this is not the right thing for you, you gotta go. Both, it's better screening, and I know they do some screening, but you gotta have much better screening because of the times that we live in. And then you have to have less tolerance for officers that are constantly offending the community by, do it, by their actions. 
I mean, I know there's a policeman's bill of rights here, but we have to deal with the fact that some people should not be on the police force. They're making it bad for the whole department. The whole department gets tarnished by the acts of a few. We can't have the tail wagging the dog. We gotta, we gotta deal with that head on. And then I think we'll have much better police community relations when you get rid of these bad apples. Uh, that are making it so bad for everybody. In fact, we've had stories here on ABC6 just recently about Central Falls Police <clears throat> going through the media, trying to let people know, hey, we, we have uh, applicants who are interested in becoming police officers in Central Falls, you want to go through the academy. Uh, the outreach of trying to reach members of the minority community, to have a police force that polices a community that is something they yeah. can relate to. The efforts to recruit minority officers, how difficult is that? And what is the selling point? And, and what do you tell people as to say, you know what, Jim, this isn't for me. I don't feel like I belong. It, it's a great career. I mean, you have people that, you know, looking for a great career. It is a great career, despite all the things that I've said. And uh, I've had about eight to 10 police chiefs that have called me and said, can I come on my TV show to kind of publicize the fact that we have recruitment drives. And sometimes they bring their mayor, they bring their, uh, you know, their captain or their, or their colonel or major with them. And, uh, and, and I welcome that. And so, you know, there are departments that are trying, they do get it, and they know that, that they ha need police forces that are reflective of the community. So I do see some movement. We need to do a lot more, of course, because we want to see the results. Uh, but I do applaud the fact that there's been movement by police forces to try to diversify. Now, the climate of seeing, you know, the, all the police brutality and whatever, it makes it harder for somebody to want to identify with that. You're talking about nationally? Nationally. Yeah. Not here. Uh, there has not been not one case of a policeman killing anybody here, and I think that that was a story that came out last week. However, nationally, I mean, we all look at uh, you know, television, we see things uh, globally. So nationally, uh, you know, there's been a chilling effect on people maybe wanting to go in because of what they see on TV. But if they heard something from you, like if Jim Vincent came to some young man who's 20 years old, say, and, and he's thinking about it or you were going to talk to him, what would that conversation be like? And, and w if you're the one doing the selling as, a, as opposed to some, just some police chief or something. I, I, I'd say, look, you know, it's got to change with somebody. Why don't it begin by you? You can help with the change. You know, we can't just be wringing our hands and, you know, woe is us. You know, we need to diversify these police forces. You, you're an excellent candidate. You need to step up and sign up and, or at least go through the process to see if that is something that, you know, uh, is for you. Uh, so I, I constantly encourage young people to go into law enforcement. I am a friend of law enforcement. I have uh, a good relationship with the police chiefs around the state, especially in Providence and especially with the uh, police commissioner in Providence and as well as the state police colonel. So I use those relationships to, 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 to bring them to, to forums or to, to talk with them about you know, uh, places that maybe they should go and help recruit. It's a partnership. You know, we're in this together. And, and I realize that, you know, if we're ever going to have a, a, a safer community, we need to have a diverse police force at every level. I think part of that, and at least I know in our conversations in the past, is having in Providence in particular a member of the command staff be an African-American, particularly a major. Very important. You, you know, uh, when you talk to the community, uh, when you talk to the police, they, you know, they, they constantly say, how do we get things better with the community? We, we Improve we, relations. Yeah, improve relations. We realize that having good community police relations is the best way for us to solve crime. That's what they say. So we go back to the community and say, well, what do you, what do you need? What, what, what would help you in terms of police community relations? And they say, we need police officers at all levels, especially in that command staff. So we go back to the police and say, we need, we need to have somebody in the command staff. In Providence, the highest rank in African American is a sergeant. So that's nowhere near the command staff. So we've gone to the mayor and the commissioner and we've said, you know, you need to have somebody in that command staff and the mayor can appoint a major, okay? And we're not talking about somebody that's just appointed that is not qualified. We're talking about somebody that is equally as qualified as anybody there, if not more qualified. Somebody that brings something to the table that can, that can lead certain divisions and make the department that much stronger. There are candidates out there that can be excellent majors and we outside, want that to happen. Outside of the department, Jim, or in? Inside and outside. And what Inside response and have you gotten from the commissioner and the mayor? Uh, well, they seem to feel that, you know, uh, it, it, over time, you know, you'll have lieutenants and captains, and then from that ranks, you will have a major. And, and we know that will happen over time. But a Ferguson or a Baltimore can happen tomorrow. We need, to, we need for somebody to be on that command staff now. Not, we can't wait. It has to be right well, now. When I hear over time, that doesn't sound like it's going to happen anytime well, soon. Well, over time will happen eventually, but what, what's eventually? Two years, five years, ten years? Not 2016. Not 2016. We needed 2016. Anything can happen, and nobody's going to say, well, you know, well, we had this process if there's a riot in Providence. They're going to say, well, how come, what did you do to kind of help with that process? 
And I'm saying that you need to have that African American and other people of color in the command staff to help navigate that process. We saw in Ferguson when the state police of Missouri sent that captain in to help with that situation because the police force in Ferguson had nobody in command. Only then did the situation begin to be become a little more uh, sustainable in terms of the, the peace and the tranquility of the community. Because he knew that community, he knew how to deal with it. He was in command and he went in and took, and took charge. And people listened to him. And they listened to him because he could relate to him. We need somebody like that in Providence. And we don't have that in the Providence Police Department. We need it. We need that black major. We need it today. All right. We're going to take a break. We're going to catch our breath. We come back more with Jim Vincent talking about the Oscars and the lack of diversity this year's nominees. We'll be right back. Welcome back down the record with Buddy Cianci. Buddy's off today. I'm John DeLuca, the ABC6 anchor filling in for him today. Uh, we're joined our guests by the president of the Rhode Island chapter of the NAACP, Mr. Jim Vincent. Uh, as we come back from break here, we were talking about so many things as it relates to Providence Police and law enforcement. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, the Oscars. And there's so much buzz right now about uh, people boycotting. Uh, Jada Pinkett Smith and, and the news this week that Will Smith, huge movie star who I personally thought should have been nominated for his role in Concussion, mm -hmm. uh, no one, not one person of all the nominees, not one of the movies, nothing um, with an African American in it. Uh, first of all, what, your reaction to that first and before well, we start talking about the boycott? Uh, in, 2000, about? in 2016, the fact, and I think this is two years in a row, that there haven't been not any not one African American nominated to the, for, for an Oscar in terms of an acting role to me is outrageous. I mean, I can't believe the, that that could happen because you have so many people like Will Smith that are so deserving of at least a nomination. I mean, we're not we're not we're not saying he has to, to get an Oscar, but he should at least be considered for an Oscar, as as well as other movies as well. This has been some other uh, people with. Well, some straight out of Compton, a lot of people thought that that would certainly be one of you know the eight movies nominated this year because that that checked a lot of boxes as to what the critics usually like to see. And uh, clearly that didn't make it. I, I, saw, I saw that um, Ice Cube had said uh, maybe we need to have a slave in it. If we had a slave in it, then we would have been nominated, well, well, making reference to 12 years of slave, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so y as you look at it now, and there is the pressure on Chris Rock to boycott. He's the host. And you know, Will Smith isn't going to be there. Spike Lee's not going to be there. Jada Pinkett Smith has already gone on record saying she's not going to be there. But then there's Viola Davis who's saying, you know what, she doesn't think that boycotting is the right way to go. Well, I mean, I, I don't know if, if that's the correct term, boycotting. I mean, if you got two or three people that are not going, I don't know if that's like a boycott. But, however, I mean, you, you, the problem is with the Academy. I mean, 94% of the Academy members are white, and then 77% of them are male, and, and I guess some of them are really out of touch. You know, so what we need, and I think we're going to get it, is change, because the president of the Academy is an African-American woman, all right? So I think she's already said, she knows that she has to change that membership because seemingly they're out of touch in terms of the full array of America, American talent. So, you know, I'm hopeful that this African-American president of the Academy can make some fundamental change in that membership, but I just think that they are out of touch. I mean, how can you not have not one African-American nominated in two years in a row? I mean, all the different African-Americans that are in movies today and all the African-Americans that go to movies, it just doesn't make any sense from any point of view. So I'm hopeful that, you know, at least um, the fact that Spike and, uh, and Jada and Will have made some statements, that might be enough to, to, to make people think, you know, hey, we've got a problem here. We, we, we need to have the Academy Awards be reflective and embraced by everybody. Would it mean a lot to you if Chris Rock didn't host and backed out at this point? I, I, I think Chris Rock is, can make his own decision. Um, I'm, I, I think he needs to, you know. I mean, would you support and say, yeah, that's a good idea, or? Uh, well, well yeah, I mean, sure. that's a personal decision he has to make. I mean, you know, obviously, if he decided not to do that for that reason, I, sh I would applaud him for that because that's a that's a personal decision that takes courage. Uh, it makes a, it makes a statement that you know we're in 2016. We're not back in 1916, and we need to have America reflected in all its glory and to just not nominate any African Americans, given the excellent uh, performances that they've done in recent years, is outrageous. I mean, George Clooney has spoken out against it. Nikita Nwongo has spoken out against it. I mean, these people are, are, are really invested in, you know, acting and movies and whatever, and they see this as, as an injustice. I've heard some people who were in stories who were either in the Academy or know people who are in the Academy and basically say, look, most of those members you talk about being out of touch, they never saw those movies. 
They never bothered to watch straight out of Compton. They didn't see concussion. They never saw any of those performances. So they don't even know what they didn't vote on or did. You know what I mean? That makes it even worse. It I does make it even worse. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. That's what the insiders are saying. And I think that's the kind of stuff that the president of the academy would certainly know yeah. that inside that most you couldn't watch all those movies. So at some point, people are saying, well, you know, they never even saw this movie. What's been, what makes it more amazing is who goes to watch movies. I mean, the people from the communities of color, they, they're disproportionate people uh, that, that go out to the movies. So, I mean, it doesn't even make, it, it makes no sense on any level. First of all, these artists deserve recognition, uh, at least a nomination. I mean, you know, let them fight it out to see if they could you, you win an Oscar, but to not even be on the playing field, that, that's egregious to me. It's funny, you know, talk about Will Smith, the two times he was nominated, um, he lost to African Americans. Right. So, and that's okay. I mean, and the fact that a person doesn't win an Oscar, right. just that's to okay. To be recognized. But, but at least be recognized for what you did. I mean, the fact that you have eight movies, I think, nominated, and Straight Outta Compton wasn't one of the eight movies, very few people uh, can understand that. I mean, Or Creed, which I thought was a great movie. Creed, uh, know you know, that. Will Smith's role in Concussion. How do you not get nominated for an Academy Award after that performance? Elba as well. A lot of people thought he should have been nominated. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of negative to, towards the Academy members. I mean, you know, they, they're, 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 they're not diverse at all. And uh, I think that that's in large part the problem. You have a president of the Academy that has said, we're going to make some changes here. And hopefully after those changes, then you won't see this again. Let's bring the conversation back to Rhode Island, and I know uh, <clears throat> test scores, and you keep it a close eye on this, standardized test scores, and we can argue about test scores all we want, but at the end of the day, the measuring stick that's being used in 2016-15 is the park scores. Uh, they were horrible for basically everybody, but in particular, inner city schools were horrendous. I mean, the proficient level was really, really abysmally low. Um, your reaction to that K through 12 education in Rhode Island is it's almost like on life support I mean you know uh, we can we can uh, talk about this test that test uh, you know being appropriate or whatever the fact is that you know we have as challenged uh, system here as anywhere in the country I mean Latino achievement in Rhode Island is last in the country we're talking about Latinos versus Latinos about in reading and math and reading science. and math I mean the Latinos in uh, New York California Texas those Latinos achieve higher than our Latinos here in Rhode Island. And, and blacks, perhaps not much better. What, what, what needs to happen is just fundamental change because, I mean, 10% of African Americans are proficient in, I think, math, and maybe 20% are proficient in English. That's horrendous. I don't care what test you take. That is not acceptable. Those kids are being denied an education. Uh, the system here is denying all our kids in education, but people of color in particular. So it's no surprise that 67% of all the students that go to the community college they need remedial work, and that's the community college. So what does that say about the system when, you know, people that go to the overwhelmingly to the community college are not ready even for community college, and they're mostly coming from the K through 12 system in Rhode Island. And look at what's going on in Massachusetts. Look at what's going on in Connecticut. They're light years ahead of us. Every single survey that comes out, we just had a story on ABC6 last week about Massachusetts literally has the best public schools in the country by right. whatever measurement was used. Right. Rhode Island was more middle of the pack. Um, that's embarrassing. Uh, within New England, Rhode Island usually does poorly. That's embarrassing. Uh, why do you think that is, and what can you do to change it? Uh, there's, just, I guess not, the, there's not a switch. If there was, we would all love to switch it. It, goes all, it always goes back to political will. You know, that's always the, the standard answer, and I guess that's the answer here. But you know, you have too many people trying to make excuses like poverty. Well, there's poverty in Massachusetts. There's poverty in Connecticut. You know, I know when I went to college, I went to school with some of the poorest kids in the country, and they excelled. They were Phi Beta Kappa. They became mayors, ambassadors. So that poverty argument, to me, does not wash at all. You know, you got to get in there. Rhode Island has extreme poverty as opposed to... Everybody else has extreme I mean, poverty, yeah. but yet they're doing light years better. You know, so how come those poor kids are doing better than our poor kids? You know, something not happening in the classrooms and in the districts and in the principal's offices and in the school committees here that's happening there. And this is years. I mean, this is, years. This is something that... Decades. That's been growing and will take years to fix. I mean, let's be honest. Hopefully I mean, it this is years to fix. But I mean, I'm saying right now, if you're an 11th grader, if you're some kid at, say, Shea or in one socket or, or whatever, if you're struggling right now, yeah. they're not going to fix anything for yeah. you between now and when you graduate. It's yeah. not going to happen. Yeah. See, I'm from Massachusetts. I think uh, most Rhode Islanders know that the system is bad, but it's really worse than they think. The system here is much worse than people think, I, I feel. As we go into 2016, here we are in January, we've got the governor's state of the state coming up. What are some of the things you'll be looking to hear in that message uh, when you see the governor up there uh, addressing the General Assembly? Well, you know, I, I, I want the governor to succeed, of course, you know, and we need to have jobs. 
you know, if we're going to uh, have a better uh, uh, state, then we have to have a better economy. We have to grow our way out. That K through 12 system is a big factor in that because jobs come to places where there are people that are trained, educated, and motivated. So if you have a trained, educated, motivated labor force, they're going to come. We have too much of a skills gap in too many areas here. So we're going to have to do something in terms of educating and getting our labor force ready. So hopefully, and I know she's working on that, hopefully as we're working on that, we can attract some businesses to come, expand the economy, more opportunity, especially in communities of color, where unemployment rates are like at 40% in some areas. And I did say 40, 4-0, 40, yes. okay? Astronomical unemployment. 25% of the state, is state of uh, are people of color. If we don't do something with that, then our state's going nowhere, period. It's too large a group. It's one-fourth of our state and growing. There's no way we can grow our way out of it if we don't do anything with that group. It's impossible. The math won't work. That dog don't hunt. Jim, we have less than a minute left. Uh, what specifically is the NAACP focused on this year in 2016? Well, we're really uh, focusing on uh, several bills. One bill would uh, reduce the out-of-school suspension of kids. Uh, we have uh, an ACLU study that said that uh, kids of color, especially African Americans, are suspended three times, four times, five times more than white students for the same offense out of school. Being out of school helps no one. Doesn't help the kid, doesn't help the family, doesn't help the community, doesn't help our state. We've got to make sure we minimize that in cases that are, you know, uh, discretionary. We have to stop that, so I hope that bill passes. And there's other, there's gun control bills that need to pass. There's other things in terms of high stakes, stakes testing that needs to be revisited. I'm not in favor of high stake testing as a graduation requirement. And there's also, uh, a no number of bills that will help with jobs that I, I feel that you know, need to be supported. All right. Jim Vincent, thank you so much for joining us for this week's edition of On the Record with Buddy Cienci. Hope you have a great weekend and hope you didn't hurt yourself shoveling. <laughs>